right, everybody, welcome up my father, Daddy D, as we get through week two of Our Father Teaching Us in Prayer. Thank you, Ryan. We were pretty hard on him to make sure he kept that announcement really tight. And congratulations. <laughs> he did pretty well. <laughs> All right, well, we are in week two of looking at prayer. And um, so Jesus picked 12 guys, 12 good-hearted guys. And sometimes when I'm on my bench, I think about this. What would that have been like? Hanging out with Jesus for three years, right? <laughs> what would, I mean... Let your mind go there sometime. <laughs> Start reading the Bible and look at Jesus' life from that perspective. But one of the things that really stood out to them was Jesus' prayer life. They started realizing that for Jesus, prayer was like breathing. It was necessary, but it was a priority. And it was, it was something that, some way that he was praying that they had never seen before. And they realized that prayer was intimacy. Prayer was relationship with his father. Prayer was an absolute priority in Jesus' life. So some point down the line, they said, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. They wanted in. They realized that Jesus had a foundation. Jesus had power for living. Jesus had security in whatever he was doing, more confidence in what he was doing because of the way he was speaking to God the Father in the secluded places continually every single day. So they said, hey, teach us how to pray like that. So Jesus said, all right, okay. I'm gonna give you a model for prayer. Before I do that, let me give you some guidelines. Here's some guidelines. Don't be a hypocrite when you pray. <laughs> be real. Don't act like this over here. And then when you get before God, act like that. Who do you think you're kidding? God is God. God knows. Be real. Be sincere when you pray. And when you pray... Don't do it for show. Go to an inner room. Close the door. Get before the Father and speak to God the Father. The audience of prayer is the God of the universe. Get in front of him. Find your place. So yeah, guys, find a place on your property that's your place to meet with God, to pray that's your secluded place. Whether that's a chair in your house, whether it's a bench outside, somewhere on your property, make it a regular place where you go to meet with God and pray. That's a, one of the guidelines that Jesus gave us. And he said, don't babble. <laughs> don't babble on. God already knows what you need. Speak, realize who you're talking to, and then speak to him. It's not a head thing, it's a heart thing. Speak from the heart. So then he said, now, okay, here's the model. Here's how you pray. It's a second verse down. So then this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's as far as we're going to go today, but we're going to take each one of those pieces and say, okay, let's think about this for a minute. What was it that Jesus was saying? So he starts out with the word our. We're not the only kid. <laughs> when you go to the Father, you're not the only kid. How many men in here have more than one kid? All right. <laughs> So you know what it's like when one of your kids say, hey, Dad, can I have this? And what do you process? You process him, but you're also processing your other kids, right? Is this balanced? Is this fair? <laughs> How does this work within the family? You think God does the same thing? Remember that when we pray, it's not just my father, but it's <coughs> our father. Look at the verse. I put down, in my father's house are many mansions. <laughs> if it were not so, I would have told you. So yeah, we are part of a family. When we're praying, we need to realize that. It's not just about us. You know, in my house, I have a security code, right? I'm sure most of you do. Besides my wife and I, you know who, you know who knows the code? Ryan, my daughter Rachel, the grandkids. My family knows the code, so if I'm not there, anybody can get in my house. We have an access to God the Father, into his house for prayer, but we're not the only one. So we don't want to go in and just take it all for ourselves, right? <laughs> because we are part of a family. And so the very first thing in Jesus' model is pray, our Father. Do you know that was revolutionary when he said that? 
up to this point, no, no prophet, no rabbi, nowhere in the Old Testament was God ever referred to as Father. And now Jesus in the model says, say, start out by saying, our Father. He went right to the core reason why he came, his redemptive plan, to rebuild the relationship, a personal relationship with God the Father so that we can be considered and look at ourselves as a child. We can actually look at, at God of the universe as dad. Now, I don't know what your relationship is with your dad. In the best case, it's not perfect, right? But God is a good, good, good father. And so what Jesus is saying is look at him that way. When you go to prayer, realize that you're going to a loving, caring father who sometimes, and this was true with my dad, and I'm sure Ryan would say the same thing. I'm sure each of you would say the same thing. I didn't always get my dad's head, but you know what? I knew my dad's heart, and I knew whatever he did, he was looking out for the best for me. And my dad was wiser and had more knowledge of, than me as, during my growing up years, and there was no doubt about it. My dad was always looking out the best for me. And that's what God does for us when we go to him. So we start out by saying, our father. Take a look at the quote um, that's in there by Andrew Murray. If you, if, you, if you like to read an excellent book on prayer, pick up Andrew Murray's book on With Christ in the School of Prayer. It's a classic. Um, he dissects prayer probably better than any other book that I've read on the subject of prayer. Uh, but here's what he says, our father. The words are key to the whole prayer and to all of prayer. So, don't let whatever distorted view of Father that you may have here interrupt what God is as our Father. I listed just a few things. God knows our needs. God has compassion. God protects. God disciplines. God gives what is good. God's always there. Inseparable love. Here's why I go to the bench. Psalm 16, verse 8 summarizes it. I don't know who wrote Psalm 16, verse 8. I tried to do some research to find out who it was, and nobody knows. But this is what I know about the guy who wrote Psalm 16, verse 8. He had a bench. <laughs> Listen to what he says. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Guys, if you take out time to go to your chair and go to your bench and start out by saying, Our Father, and then lay before him everything that's on your heart and listen back, you will live a life that, where you are not shaken. Your eyes on him, whatever it is you're going through, you'll not be shaken. He'll do that for us. Look at Romans 8. This is Paul, who we know had a great prayer life. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> this is just a small sampling of what we're told in the Bible about who God is who he is as our father. We have to, with everything that goes on in our life, with the way we get hammered down in business, in pressures, in family, listen to the new, whatever all the negative stuff is, guys, we have to step aside and look up and speak to our father and concentrate on who he is and what we have because of our relationship with him. That's what gives us strength. That's what gives us balance. That's what gives us direction. So, our Father who art in heaven, who is in heaven. <laughs> so why does Jesus put that in there as part of the model? That remind ourselves that he's in heaven. This week, um, Tuesday, I went to Athens to see one of our stores. On the way coming home, I drove by a football field and I looked over and at the 50-yard line, 
And I was surprised because I, th I thought it was a junior high school. It might have been a high school, but either way, uh, about 15 yards back, there was this tower built. White tower, white steps going up, big platform up above. At the 50-yard line, this little football field. So what was that there for? <laughs> I, Ann, who works for us, was sitting next to me. I said, look at that. What's that for? She said, the band. <laughs> Right, so if you're a band director and you want the band to be marching properly, you have to be able to see it properly, right? And so the band director goes up and he's, he's teaching the band how to move, how to march, how to be, so he can see it all from up there. As we pray, our Father who is in heaven, Jesus is teaching us to remind ourselves, God is above it all. He sees it all. And he's working as, like a band director, he's working making everything move properly. And so it's already part of a surrender as we're talking to God in this model, reminding ourselves of who is in heaven. So John, the Apostle John, was on Patmos Island as a prisoner because of what he was doing, building the church, spreading the news about Jesus. And the Spirit comes to him. And next thing you know, he's lifted in the Spirit and a voice says, come on in, come through the gate. And he enters the throne room of God who is in heaven. If you want an interesting read, an interesting study, go to Revelation 4. And take a look at what he saw and what is in that throne room. 24 elders on the throne who get up and say, holy, holy, holy is your name. And they fall before him. I don't know if this is why praying it, and it was on it, some, it traditionally has been on our knees because that's the model. When you realize who you're talking to, you fall down before him, right? No time to continue on with that, but read Revelation 4. Our Father, who is in heaven, above it all, you see it all. Hallowed be your name. What is God's name? Jesus says when you, the model for prayer Realize that it's, that it's us, it's our. He is our Father, he is in heaven. And let's take a second and say, hallowed be your name. Moses asked, what's your name? I'm gonna go see Pharaoh. You're asking me to tell the most powerful guy on the planet to let my people go, who are all serving him for nothing. When he says, who sent you, who should, what should I say? He says, tell him, I am sent you. I am what? I am everything. I am. I went to a, a gathering Tuesday night, and I met an old friend who was there, Leah Wells. And uh, so we were talking about the honors. I don't know if anybody has played up there, but a guy named Lumpkin started. He was upset because he got turned down at, the, at Augusta National as a member. So he decided to build a golf course to rival it. And he built a great golf course up there. And if you go in the men's club room, there's a picture of his board of directors. So it shows 12 men around the table, and the head is his picture. <laughs> Every one of the 12 of them. The, the, the me it's, it's hilarious. The message he's sending is, yeah, I am the founder, I am the funder, I am the CEO, <laughs> I am the decision maker. I am the, I'm basically he's saying, I'm everything here, period. <laughs> humorous, right? <laughs> but in God's case, it's not so humorous because that's who he is. God says, I am. One of the first things that I did when Gail pushed me to the bench <laughs> was A, learn how to play, pray, hold a basketball, realizing who I was talking to the God who can hold the universe. But then I also did a study on his names. Adonai, Elohim, Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, El Shaddai, El Elyon. I mean, all these names. When, when Jesus says, hallowed be your name, maybe we should take the time to learn what those names are. Because names at the time the Bible was written, were indicative, they meant something. And so when God provides names of who he is, he's telling us something about who he is. 
guys, when Jesus gives us a model like this, why don't we take it serious? As much as we know about all kinds of people, and if you follow sports, all kinds of players and whatever, maybe take some of that time over here and say, God, help me as I sit on my bench to get to know you better. Help me as I study your names to realize your character. And what are you telling me about you through your name? So when I come to you in prayer, I really realize who you are even more so. And what you say to me about who you are through the names that, you, that you've given me, Adonai. Jehovah Rapha, wow. All right, your kingdom come. We all have a kingdom, right? <laughs> we all have a kingdom the position that we're in, the company that we're a part of or the company that we own, the family that we are leading. Whatever it is, typically in prayer, we rush to God and we say, God, here's my plans, bless it. Bless my plans, bless my kingdom. <laughs> That's a habitual way that we can easily fall into a going to prayer. What Jesus has reminded us is, hey, God, your kingdom come. You have a kingdom. I want to get in line with your kingdom. I want to match up with whatever it is that you're moving during this time that you put me on this planet. What are you up to? What, what is moving right now? How can I be a part of that? You have a great kingdom. Look at some of those verses. This kingdom is everlasting. Our kingdom is this big and this small. It's going to end before we know it. Yours is everlasting. How can I be a part of that for all eternity? Teach me that. Give me this mindset. As I begin to, as I'm entering prayer, remind me of that. That's what Jesus is saying. Put this, get, get yourself back in perspective here. You know, there's a couple people that were big, powerful guys in their time. And they got it. Look what David said, 1 Chronicles 12, 29, 11 and 12. Yours, O Lord, is the greatest and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth belongs to you. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. And you are exalted as head over all. Here's a guy who ran all Israel. Most powerful guy in the, in the world at that time. Both riches and honor come from you. And you are the ruler over all. In your hands are power and might to exalt and to give strength to all. Amen. <laughs> so at Encounter, we studied Ezekiel. Interesting guy. He was planted amongst the 20,000 exiles. God picked him to be a prophet so he could be the voice letting these people know what was going on. They were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in the world. Meanwhile, in the palace, God planted another guy named Daniel to get next to Nebuchadnezzar, who he referred to as his servant, who he used to bring judgment on Israel. But he had a message for Nebuchadnezzar. You ain't all that. I picked you. <laughs> I picked you, you'd be nothing if it wasn't for me. And through dreams that God put on, on in Nebuchadnezzar, and through interpretations through Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar was told, if you keep pounding your chest, God's gonna humble you. You have an opportunity to give glory to the one true God. And if you don't do it, you're not gonna like what's gonna happen. Nebuchadnezzar ignored it. He stood before the city of Babylon and said, look at what my hands have done. Look at the power of my might. Look at what I have created. And when those words came out of his mouth, he was struck with insanity in a second. The voice said, I'm taking it all from you and he went out and lived amongst wild animals eating grass naked for seven years while Daniel kept things going. Imagine what the people thought. What if, I mean, thankfully there was no CNN and Fox News at the time. <laughs> Some of the world might not have known it, like who's really in the throne room. But he was out there. And then take a, take a look at it. Daniel 4, verse 34. But at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is one of the most powerful men that have ever lived on this planet, thanks to what God gave to him, looked up to heaven, and my insanity was restored to me. Then I praised the Most High, and I honored and glorified him who lives forever. 
For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. So yeah, when we pray, as part of our leading, we're saying our Father. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name and your kingdom come. I'm about ready to give you some stuff that's important to me right now. Help me understand how that fits into your kingdom. And then, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're five statements in. We haven't talked about us yet. <laughs> That's Jesus' model. You're going, when you go to your inner room and you close the door, he's not talking about public prayer right here, like when we pray before we, you know, when, when we pray before we start. When things, he's talking about you. When you go to your inner room, when you pray, your model is, Go here first. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I haven't talked to him about me yet. <laughs> wow. And what's God's will? We need to send it to the table. Study God's will sometime. It's a big, big topic. There's God's compassionate will. His will is that all men be saved. But he gives us free will. He has a commanded will. Do this. Do that. And he has a comprehensive will. No matter what we do, his will is still going to go through. Because I am is going to make sure that things happen the way they're going to happen. He lets us, but he'll move. He'll move all things for our good when we believe him. But his will is all comprehensive. And for that, we humble ourselves and fall before him. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. All right, let's go to the tables and then we'll close up here in a little bit. Let me hear a little bit from the room. Um, something regarding prayer that stood out to you to this morning. Let's hear from a few guys. Something regarding prayer, how you may be approaching your prayer life, adjustment you might make, an aha, a reminder, whatever that might have been. Uh, anybody? We've never heard from the balcony when I asked this question, have we? I'm going to roam up there for a second. <laughs> Um, what really stood out to me, though, man, is your will be done, because every day that we get up and we have any type of role or responsibility, whether that's business, family, or whatever, it's kind of my will, my will, my will, and it's like, gosh, now I got to rely on his will, and whatever happens out here, can I handle that? And uh, absolutely, that just stood out to me in capital letters. Yeah, that's, I, I understand why Jesus went there because that's a part of a surrender in prayer, right? Because, uh, you know, hey, how many have kids that once they grow older, the only time you hear from them is they want something? <laughs> and then you scratch your head and go. <laughs> <laughs> but you start scratching your head and go, is that all I'm here for? It's like... <laughs> So let's not be that to God, right? But surrendering our will and saying, look, what's, in, what's important to you? Uh, anybody else? Ed. For me, when I talk about God's will, it always falls under the umbrella of God's greatest commandment. Love me with your whole heart, mind, and soul, and love each other the same way. And then Jesus' last commandment defines it. Love like I have loved you. That's pretty powerful. That is very powerful and very central. Hey, why should we study? Why should we take out time to study the names of God? I mean, I threw that out this morning. Why would we do that? 
let's say that I'm forming a really tight relationship with you, and you're known by this name, this nickname, whatever it may be. My, my grandson's names are RJ and Chip. All right, so let's say you're called Chip, and we're together, and all I do is call you Steve. <laughs> and you're like, don't you want to know why people call me Chip? No. <laughs> At some point, you're going to be like, well, I thought we were like getting tight. I thought, you know, God gives us his, all these names that he's called because he wants us to understand certain things about his character. If we go, but that ain't important. Well, I want to know who D.D. Washington is, the wide receiver from Jaguars, <laughs> because I have a fantasy football team. <laughs> so, look, guys, I, God gives us these things for a reason. And prioritize your bench, prioritize your time, prioritize prioritize getting no to him. We're going to pause in this series on prayer as I travel a little bit. Jeff's going to speak next week on who's watching. Hutch is going to come and kick off a series that we're going to continue through the fall on, on wise guys. We'll come back on prayer, but this is a good place to pause. Five things, the first five things as we go to our private room is we take our attention and we turn it to God. Let this just kind of simmer for a little bit. Go back and challenge yourself. Are you just going, God bless me, God help me, God help them? Or is some of that incense that we see in the room up there that he's seeing and smelling coming from you saying, wow, God, you are so great. As a father, doesn't it feel good to you when your kid says, hey, thank you for being who you are. Thank you that you are this for me and this for me and this for me. God is, we're reflective of him. God likes that. And Jesus God's son said, when you go to the Father, honor him. Realize he's in heaven. Realize he's, his kingdom is everlasting. May his kingdom come and surrender so that his will be done. Now, what, do you want to, what are you asking him? <laughs> if that's all in line, 1 John, I didn't put that verse down. 1 John 5, I think it's 14 and 15. Go ahead and mark that down and read that this weekend. If you ask anything, 1 John 5, verses, I believe it's 14 and 15. If it's not there, you'll find it in 1 John 5. If you ask anything according to my will, I'll do it. What's his will? We get in line with it. How many sports enthusiasts do we have in the room? I love watching all kinds of sports. I Particularly some sports, I only watch the championship, right? When it gets down to the end, it's interesting to watch a championship game. Sometimes the post game is really inspiring and sometimes it's not, right? <laughs> Depending upon what they're saying and what they're doing. But you know what consistently is inspiring? The Olympic post game. The NFL, the NBA, the baseball, the soccer. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, depending upon what they're saying afterwards. But the Olympics post game is always inspiring. You know why that is? Because they stand on a platform and the national anthem, <laughs> from the country they represent is played because they played for that country. It's not about them in the Olympics. It's about the country you represent. And that's the way the Olympics are set up. So my question to you, what are you playing for? Is it his kingdom and his will? Is that what's reflective? Are you an inspiring guy to be around because people see in you it's not all about you? It's about somebody else? I will say this. Seeing somebody model prayer really helps us to want to pray, to pray right. Thankfully, I had a couple people in my life who model prayer very well. One I happen to be married to, and that's very helpful. But the question I ask myself, am I modeling prayer for anybody? Do people see that I'm a person who has prayer, and does that influence other people? Because I'm grasping that. If you don't have a model of someone who prays well in your life, decide that you're gonna be that model. And you only can do that by taking the time to say, okay, Jesus gave us some guidelines. Jesus gave us a model. Am I thinking about that, constrained about it? Am I putting that in, am I starting to grow in that? Am I grabbing other people, my wife, my kids? Am I saying, let's pray together? And then they are hearing me, my heart talking to God together. Are we, start, are we doing that, are we that guy? You want to be that guy. <laughs> so let's do that, all right? All right, guys, close at your table. Um, I will see you in a few weeks down the road. Uh, and I look forward to watching the films as uh, 
as uh, Jeff and Hutch um, teach in the next couple of weeks. So close your table, appreciate you coming, and we'll see you down the road a little bit. Thanks, guys. One Thing for Men meets at Cabernet Steakhouse in Alpharetta, Georgia on Friday mornings from 7 to 8 a.m. If you live in the Atlanta area or visit the area on Friday, we would love to have you join us in person. And if you have been blessed by this message, please consider supporting One Thing for Men online.